Hi, my name is Kathy. Welcome. Today I'm going to be doing a full face of makeup and hair, and I'm going to be discussing with you the case of John Frazier, also known as the Killer Prophet. Okay, let's talk about Johnny Boy. John Linley, that's his middle name, Linley, Frazier, uh, was born January 20th. Oh, I really did get that on my hair, didn't I? This is starting off really good. <laughs> Anyways, uh, born January 20th, 1946 in Ohio. Didn't find out who his parents were. Um, really not a whole lot of information about his childhood. What I could find is that he had a normal childhood, normal family, normal, normal, normal. Nothing crazy, um, whatever that means for that time. So uh, with that being said, John, as a 20-something year old, was known to be a hard worker and reliable, responsible, clean, just a good guy, just a real nice guy. He had a wife and a kid, maybe kids, also another thing I couldn't find, but I know he had at least one. And he was a good husband, sweet guy, real nice guy. So, so far, we like John. We're with John, okay. In the late 1960s, John was in a car accident and he suffered a head injury. Um, not exactly, I'm not exactly sure on what type of head injury, but there was a head injury. It was somewhat serious. And, um, when he was recovering, it was like he was a completely different person. So that head injury affected some part of his brain and he was no longer the John that everyone knew. He was no longer the John that his wife knew, which could you imagine that? Could you imagine if your husband got into a car accident or whatever your significant other and they're just like a completely different person now? And he, it wasn't like he was like a completely different person. He was still a good guy. No, it was like he turned into a very aggressive, just like a completely insane person. So this poor mama, what's she supposed to do? You know, this is the 60s, so I mean, she probably didn't work. I don't really know, but I think that she was like a stay-at-home mom. And now John's just like unreliable. Uh <laughs> Um, and he's become super religious and won't, won't go anywhere without his Bible. Like he's, he sleeps with his Bible and he's, uh, spouting crazy, like religious. God is telling me that I should do this. God is telling me that I should do that. Um, and also he was really into tarot cards. So he was really obsessed with the Bible and tarot cards. So John is saying that he's uh, hearing the voice of God. And the voice of God is telling him that he needs to end materialism, that materialism is destroying the planet, um, the free world, I think, or the free universe or something. He had specific wording when he said things. Uh, but God was telling him he needed to put an end to this, which meant that he needed to start killing certain people that were supporting a materialistic lifestyle which uh, that's a little scary. So he wanted to um, basically target anyone who had a lot of, I guess, fancy things, maybe big cars, um, people who enjoyed the materialistic life. He had to stop people like that. So rich people, I guess, people that have nice things. And in this time, um, there is a big divide between straights and hippies so there is like i guess normal people that were like hard working uh whatever blue collar and then there was hippies who were just freeloaders and they didn't want to work for anything and um all of that but also hippies were seen as like evil like cult part of part of a cult or something and that's because this was right around the time of the Manson family murders. And if you don't know what that is, then 
you probably live under a rock. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but they're very well known. And so this was right around that time. This was just like this was just like a year later when John has has his accident and starts acting weird and saying really strange things. He kind of um, finds this community of hippies, for lack of a better term, I guess, and starts hanging around them. From what I gather, I guess he left his wife and child slash maybe children, um, just disappeared from their lives, which is probably a blessing for her because he was a real loose cannon and was talking about killing people. So that's not, that's pretty jarring. So he's hanging out with uh, this community of, you know, hippies, free love. And while he's around them, he's spouting off all of this too. And sometimes people who talk in a certain way, almost like a, like a prophet, these people can get a large following somehow. They can really persuade people. This guy was not one of those. He did, people did not want to follow what he was saying. People were nervous around him and didn't like that he was saying this kind of stuff. He was talking about killing people, and that's actually not what hippies are about. You know, hippies are about free love and love your neighbor and spread kindness. Like traditionally, that's actually what a hippie is. It's it's somebody who believes in being kind and you know stuff like that so he didn't really blend in with this crowd even though he looked like he would um he didn't because they were afraid of him and they didn't they weren't for that whole like yeah let's kill people that are materialistic it's not really they weren't jiving with that so john becomes obsessed with a specific family a wealthy family um the main family member, I guess you would say, the husband, dad. Can I talk? <laughs> Clearly not. Uh, his name was Victor Ota, and he was um, a doctor. He was, he was like a specialist, so he specialized in eyes and specific surgeries on eyes. So he, he wasn't just a regular doctor, as if that's like not good enough because, come on, if you're a doctor, it's pretty, it's pretty good. But he was, you know, he specialized, so uh, he's obviously wealthy and has a big home, has several cars. Um, he's a wealthy guy. He earned it, you know, but old Johnny boy was keeping an eye on this family and um, stalking them. And turns out he was like living in this cabin. And I say cabin pretty loosely because it was really just a shack with a bed in it. Um, but it was really, really close to that family's home. And so he could watch them and see what they were doing, see when they were coming and going. And he just really became consumed with this family, unfortunately for them. On October 19th, 1970, John entered the home of Victor Ota. Uh, he entered the home because he knew that nobody was there and he lied in wait. So he just, um, is that how you say it? Wow. I, someone needs to call the cops on me. I have no right to be doing this. So the first person to come home was Victor's wife and her name was Mrs. Virginia Ota. She came home, just imagine that, coming home, just like, do-do-do, put your keys on the counter or whatever you do, go about your business, and boom, there's a creep in there. And that's what happened to her. There's a creep in there, all right. It was John, and he had a firearm, and he um, forced her to, I believe, a bedroom in the home, and he gagged her and bound her, and then he, I believe that he made a phone call and um, he was able to say that Victor needs to come home, that it's an emergency and that uh, he needs to hurry home. I, I believe that I read some conflicting articles and from what I could gather, he made the phone call. Um, so now he has the first person bound and gagged and you know, he's saying crazy, things about how God's telling him that he needs to stop their materialism. 
I feel so bad for this family. The second to arrive are the his secretary, Victor's secretary, and one of his sons. Um, and his secretary's name was Mrs. Dorothy Cadwallader. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Um, so sorry if I didn't say that right, but that's her name. And then one of his sons. I don't know if it was uh, his son Derek or his son Taggart. Again, I'm sorry. I'm not 100% sure if I'm saying his name right. But um, so they come home. He forced them to the ground. He had a gun. The secretary told the son, you know, just listen to him, do what he says. Um, they're bound as well. And then he waits for the rest to come home, which are Victor and the other son. Now, this family also has two daughters. Um, but they were uh, in boarding school when this happened. So uh, thankfully they were not home, but we'll talk more about the girls later on. So Victor and his son are now bound as well. And John's just going on with this crazy Bible talk and how God is saying that he needs to kill them because they're materialistic, which I don't know whose God says that kind of stuff, but I don't know, it's kind of so he's talking to them or at them. Um, they're so scared. He's saying how he has to kill them. So they're obviously very scared. And Victor, in an effort to try to save his family and save his own life, he tries to reason with John. And he says, you know, I'll give you anything that you want, anything. Please, just please don't, please don't hurt my family. You know, please, I'll, I'll give you anything. I'll give you money. I'll, I'll give you a car, anything you want. And because John was, you know, um, an anti-materialismist, is that a thing? Uh, he, that, this just really set him off that, you know, Victor would offer him the very thing that he's trying to stop. So uh, one by one, he takes... Victor, and he takes Virginia, and he takes Dorothy. Um, I believe at a certain point they're blindfolded. He takes them out to the family pool one by one. It's so sad and so scary to think about. And he shoots them so that when they are shot, they fall into the pool. I believe Victor was shot repeatedly as he didn't die right away. Um, and then, like I said, one by one, the adults are executed and they fall into the pool. And now we have our two boys. They're young. You know, they're kids. They're little kids. And apparently John really struggled with this. He, uh, this is according to him. So, uh, but he said he really struggled and he just prayed and prayed and prayed and tried to reason with God and, you know, please don't make me do this. Please, they're, they're children. But God gave him his answer. And God said um, something to the effect of, you know, guilty by association. So sin, the sins of a father uh, makes these boys deserve to die, I guess. So he backed it up with some Bible verse, who knows. But um, he killed those little boys too, same way. Okay, so now that he has um, did what he came to do, he so all five of these people are now in the pool. And uh, so he goes on to do a few other things. He goes inside of Victor's home, uses Victor's typewriter to write a letter. He also moves two of the family vehicles and they're kind of like blocking the driveway. And that could have been like an effort to make it a little harder for police to, to come and see what's going on. But also we're dealing with someone who the logic is different than a normal person. So who knows why he did that? Um, but he, you know, typed out the note, put the note on the windshield of one of the cars. And then he set little fires throughout the house um, I think it was an attempt to burn all of these uh, material things or maybe to get rid of evidence, but I think it was probably more about the fact that these were, 
you know, material things and why do people need these things? And this is what he's trying to end. Um, the fires didn't take, uh, they did, you know, create smoke and, and so on and so forth, but they didn't by any means burn the house down or really anything in it. Um, but they did cause the neighbors to, you know, be very worried, worried enough to call somebody. And um, so police and fire department are alerted that there's a fire at the neighbors. Neighbors also told police that they had seen somebody um, around the area uh, carrying a gun. And they tried to explain what he looked like. Um, and he, I think he had like grown his hair out. He, yeah, he had let his hair grow out and his beard. And um, he was carrying around a gun. So everyone had, you know, all these neighbors had noticed this. A uh, guy, you know, looking shady, milling around with a gun. And so police um, were, you know, searching around to find this character. Um, they find, you know, the scene. They see the cars blocking the area. They find the bizarre note. Um, it took a little bit for them to find the bodies in the pool. At first, it just looked like the pool was... Um, filled with blood. I mean, the whole pool was red and there was smoke. And so it took them a little, a, a bit to notice that there were five bodies in the pool. So this became very, very serious. And they, the police were not dragging their feet. They were on a mission to find this guy and they were actively looking everywhere. Okay. So I have the note here, um, that he wrote that was left on the car and I'm going to read it. Um, this is exactly what was written. <clears throat> Halloween 1970. Today, World War III will begin. As bought to you by the people of the free universe, from this day forward, anyone and or everyone or company of persons who misuses the natural environment or destroys same will suffer the penalty of death by the people of the free universe. I and my comrades from this day forth will fight until death or freedom against anyone who does not support natural life on this planet. Materialism must die or mankind will stop. And then it's signed in all caps, Knight of Wands, Knight of Cups, Knight of Pentacles, Knight of Swords. Um, at the time, finding this note, uh, they were thinking that maybe there were four people involved because it's signed by four people. But when they started to try to investigate maybe who this group of people were going to the actual hippie community, um, this community helped to say, hey, this, this guy, John Frazier, he's really into tarot. Um, he's been spouting um, very violent things about wanting to kill people that are uh, obsessed with materialism. And those are actually four tarot cards. Uh, so they started looking into tarot. Um, these investigators and trying to figure out how they could pin down this guy. And I think that, I don't think that they said his name was John Frazier. Um, I could be wrong about that, but they did give them the information about tarot cards. And so these people, these investigators started looking into tarot, which is interesting. I thought, I, I thought that was an interesting part of it. So um, they searched the area around the home of these poor people and they found that shack that he was living in and they looked in there and there was only just a bed and a pair of binoculars and um so they're pretty uh, they're pretty confident that this is where he was staying so they took turns just waiting like in the bushes watching this cabin which i thought was awesome like these investigators were not going to give up on this. Like they were going to find this guy. And after four days of surveilling, they finally got him. They saw him show back up and he went inside of the cabin, if you can call it that. And they went in there and they're like, Hey, uh, you're coming with us. And he, he was fine with it. Like he didn't resist it or anything. He asked for a glass of water. And that was that. I tried underliner. Don't love it. No, 
hate it. Gonna be right back. Yeah. Okay, so remember those binoculars, like the only other thing that was in that shack? Come to find out those binoculars actually belonged to Victor. So that means that he was entering the home without them knowing, which doesn't really surprise me very much because he was really watching them and um, seemed like he knew his way around the house when it came time to wait around for everybody. Not that I was there, but just from what I've gathered. So yeah, those binoculars were Victor's pretty, pretty messed up. And on his first, the first day of his trial, so like he's arrested, obviously, uh, he didn't put up a fight. He was, you know, fine with it, I guess. Um, awkward pause. Uh, his first day of trial, he came with half of his face shaved for real. So half of his face had the beard and, and eyebrow <laughs> and hair and the other half, just nothing bald, no eyebrow, no beard, nothing. Um, why did he do that? Um, not sure, but he looked like a psycho. <laughs> So anyways, his lawyer was like, maybe shave the rest of it, okay? Because this is not going to bode well for you. So he did. He shaved the rest of it, and it was, he was just like a cue ball, so it was fine, you know. John was sentenced to death on November 29th, 1971. Um, but in 1972, the death penalty was abolished in California. So his sentence was commuted to life in prison. Um, he was a, a model inmate, I guess, so he didn't cause any scenes or anything like that, which is surprising to me because it seemed like he was very much a loose cannon. Um, but I guess the mindset changes once you're in prison. I, I don't know yet. Just kidding. I don't plan on going to prison. Anyways, um, so fast forward to August 13th, 2009. John passed away. He was in the 60s. Um, he had taken his own life. He, um, he hung himself, which everyone was surprised by that because... Um, like I said, he was a model prisoner. Everything seemed fine, but he killed himself. Um, the tragedy didn't end there though. Remember I told you that they had two surviving daughters. Um, they had a really hard time, you know, losing their entire family this way. Anybody would, um, but they just never really got past it. Um, in 1977, Torin which was one of the daughters. She was at this point 25 years old. Um, she committed suicide. She, she just couldn't, she was just very depressed. She had married once, divorced, married again. She had, a, she had given birth, she had a baby, um, but she just couldn't, she couldn't cope with it. So um, she took her own life. Uh, she was found in her mother-in-law's garage. She had taken some pills and also um, had the car running, so she died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And then another death within the family uh, in 1979, Victor's mother hung herself. She was um, living in kind of like an assisted living for uh, the elderly. She was 78 years old and she also just couldn't uh, handle the pain, so she took her own life. And uh, so the only living person besides the baby is uh, the other daughter, Lark. So Lark was the younger daughter and um, she's the only survivor. She lives in seclusion. She does not want to be found. She does not want to be contacted. So, you know, leave her alone. Don't try to, don't try to find her. Um, but that's the story of John Frazier. Uh, I found this story to be really interesting because of the head trauma. So there's um, actual, there's actually several cases where people were by all accounts, a, a certain way their whole life, and then something happened, they suffered head trauma, and then they went from being like who they were to somebody completely different. So I hope you enjoyed the video. This is the look. Um, I used all old makeup. So I, again, used all um, expired makeup, like real expired. <laughs> but anyways, this is the hair. Um, this is David Bowie back here. Hi. Anyways, thank you so much. Um, like, subscribe, share with your friends or don't either way. Just have a great day. Bye.